Good morning from Maine in the United States. My name is Holly Parker. I am the director of UNE North, the Institute for North Atlantic Studies at the University of New England. And, and welcome to this uh, first event of the Bioregional Planning for Resilient Rural Communities thematic network of the UArctic. On behalf of UNE, the Agricultural University of Iceland, the University of Highlands and Islands, University of Tumen and Sustainometrics, I wanna welcome you to this event. Many of you may know that the University of the Arctic is a collaboration of institutions, more than 200 of them around the globe, that have come together to focus on issues of a more sustainable north. Under the UArctic, we have several uh, thematic networks, more than 60 of them, which allow us to focus on specific areas within sustainable development. This new thematic network, the Bioregional Planning for Resilient Rural Communities Network, is an interdisciplinary international network of researchers and practitioners committed to first understanding the role that bioregional systems and strategies can play in supporting rural northern communities and activating those strategies in an intentional place-based way to promote resilience in the face of climate change and other disruptive events such as the pandemic. For this work, we are using Bergen Dagman's definition of the bioregion. Quote, this term refers both to geographic terrain and a terrain of consciousness, to a place and the ideas that have developed about how to live in that place. And my colleague Glenn Page will speak a little bit more to this in his presentation, but we really are focused on the power of bioregioning in this moment in time. The bioregion's boundaries are not fixed by human or political factors, but rather take into account flora, fauna, climate rivers, lakes, mountains, and valleys. It is a place-based organizing structure most suited to understanding the potential mechanisms to supporting resilient communities. And here on the right, you will see uh, the bioregion that I am most familiar with. This is the bioregion of the Gulf of Maine, where much of my work is happening here at UNE North. But we are connecting this work through networks like this one to projects that are happening throughout the North Atlantic transect. So the network's mission, and we hope you will choose to join us in this mission, is to serve as an interdisciplinary platform by which institutions and local communities can leverage bioregional planning strategies and toolkits to support resilient rural communities in the North. This mission differs somewhat from the other missions in the UArctic thematic network, which often focus primarily on research as opposed to implementation. We're very excited to be able to move some of what we have learned through our work into communities to help them plan for their futures. So to that point, our three strategic priorities are be to curate existing strategies and toolkits and support their optimization and customization for specific bioregions. Again, this work is very place-based, and so there is no best practice, but it is context-driven place-based practice. The network will place particular focus on the engagement of the people of the place, on intergenerational engagement, and on engagement of community members in the margins. And finally, the network will provide programming as many such networks do, such as webinars like today and symposia in hopes to disseminate project-based work and its impacts to the UArctic community and beyond. Again, I want to highlight that one of the key strategic priorities of this work is honoring and engaging the people of the place. Terza Poe, an Inuit educator and an advisor to me here at UNE North writes, the successful solutions we can develop to our most pressing environmental, social, and economic issues will be in collaboration with people and communities, especially those with the lived experience so critical to sustainable success. And my colleague, Glenn Page, who you'll hear from shortly, refers to this as working at the speed of trust. And so these are two core values to the work that we will be doing both here in Maine and across this broad network. And of course, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals play a part in all of this work. And here at UAE North and throughout this network, Sustainable Development Goal 17, partnerships uh, for the goals is a core value, not just the way we work, but it's how and why we work. So just to the nuts and bolts of the, of the thematic network, and this is where we start, this is not necessarily the ending of what we might do together, but in our first year, we hope to conduct working meetings, begin dissemination of our work through traditional methods like scientific outputs and policy briefs, but also talk a little bit more about public engagement and how we can move this work out of academia and into the public space. We're very interested in mobility as well as student engagement and also in how we might develop teaching and training for folks who want to understand bioregioning a little bit further for their own use. So welcome 
we hope today will uh, give you an idea of where we want to take this brand new network. You Arctic members and non-members are welcome to join the network. So you need not be a U Arctic member to join us. You have my email there and you can see it later today as well. It was also on the invitation. The first network working meeting will be held in October. We will be doing this in conjunction with the Arctic Circle Assembly. So it will be sometime between October 14th and 16th. We haven't nailed down the date yet, but it will be a hybrid meeting where those of you who are lucky enough to be in Reykjavik, uh, we will have a space there and then we will Zoom in others. An agenda is forthcoming to include project sharing and discussion of student and indigenous community engagement. So please stay tuned. Um, and also an invitation to submit any resources and events that you have going on in your work to our network website, where we will be having a, a listing of resources and events for anyone inside or outside the network. And with that, I'm gonna hand over the presentation to my colleague, Glenn Page from Sustainometrics. Well, thank you, Holly. And thank you so much for your leadership. Leadership in this case really, really matters. And it's been really an honor to work with you uh, in this process. So greetings, everyone. My name is Glenn Page, President and CEO of Sustainometrics, uh, but also global lead of a group called COBALT, the Collaborative for Bioregional Action Learning and Transformation. And it's a real joy to be with everyone. We have folks uh, from here in the Gulf of Maine, uh, as well as Iceland, Scotland, and Siberia. And it's really a powerful potential, what we're talking about here, this U-Arctic thematic network. And so I'm just gonna briefly introduce some of our work around the power of bioregioning and some of the core principles. So it was about 10 years ago, almost to the month, this was June, 2011, that The Economist, one of the world's, in fact, I think it is the world's most widely distributed uh, magazine, actually had this on the cover, Welcome to the Anthropocene. And of course, The Economist is rooted in neoliberal uh, economic theory. Um, one might say growth is good. Uh, that underscores this magazine. Well, here it actually framed this challenge, this issue of Welcome to the Anthropocene basically saying that we are the first generation to know that we are changing the fundamental nature of life support systems here on planet Earth. So this in some ways was a wake up call to the normal growth is good paradigm. And then we may say, well, wait a second, 10 years later, COVID, wildfires, hurricanes, floods, what has actually happened? So it's as if there are two forces in the world going on right now, uh, further deepening around maximizing one's own profit uh, and the sense of moving to, towards Earth system stewardship. So as we think about the realities and what it means in terms of living in the Anthropocene, we know the data, we know the realities, we know the situation, we know the IPCC projections. The key question that we're framing with this network is what's the response? How do we actually understand response at a bioregional scale? Well, one of the domains of response is to look at Earth systems stewardship and Earth systems governance over time. And development of Earth system science is really only about 40, 50 years old. Climate concern in the 80s and 90s. This idea, this new name of the Anthropocene right around the turn of the century. Um, planetary boundaries, SDGs, and Paris Agreement. These are critically important domains. But what's so powerful is that these are at the global scale. What is going on at the bioregional scale? And that's what this thematic network is all about. And again, this frame on action learning. Here's a very nice uh, image from um, the uh, PNAS of 2018 of understanding that the Earth systems itself is on a rapid descent, likely crushing uh, tipping points into what could be a hothouse Earth into a very stabilized ball and basin frame. But there is this opportunity to actually shift this, we think, with a very significant application and and dedication towards Earth system stewardship. Never been done in the history of humanity. Here's an opportunity. We need to learn together 
what the implications are. So that is our work that we're framing here. And it begins with a principle of Anthropocene as context. So, so much of the work and the reason why we are framing this at a bioregional scale is to understand and face the realities of the Anthropocene at the local context and learn how to act accordingly. And that includes understanding things like governance response to ecosystem change. Global thinking, while we're working and framing our work at the bioregional scale, applying these whole earth big picture thinking to all aspects of this work. And that's why this engagement across the Northern arc of the North Atlantic all the way to Siberia is so critically important to bring this together. But also acting, we use the term globally. So it's the conjunction of global and local because of this very strong need to understand the local context that's grounded in the interactions between the bioregional and the global processes scales of change. So as we consider the, the um, issues going on in the Arctic, uh, this is a critically endangered system, or it's a system that's at a rapid tipping point. Uh, one might call it the air conditioner for the Northern Hemisphere, and it's completely changing. It is at a tipping point, the world's newest navigable ocean that has huge challenges and huge opportunities and huge amount of business and further development is actually moving towards the Arctic with also huge issues of global security, economics, human and ecosystem health, biodiversity, issues of indigenous communities, cultures and livelihoods of millions of people. And this is perhaps the only window we will have of getting the global governance right for the Arctic. And that's why having the uh, Arctic Circle Assembly and presenting this thematic network at the Arctic Circle Assembly is so important for this coming up meeting. So this idea of overarching integration, how do we come together as a network to actually work together to in, not just integrate this idea of sustainability, holding on, or even resilience, responding to the next storm and then coming back the same. It's really about transformation. What does that ultimately mean? Large scale systems change. And how does that weave into the design, the implementation, and the evaluation of the work that we're doing at a bioregional scale? So this work is based upon years of work for, of, of, from us, but also from you and your colleagues. And it's coming together and learning from each other of what has gone on, what's the kind of work that we're involved in, how can our um, methods and frameworks and ways of engaging come together in a transformative way. One of the tools that we use is this concept of an ecosystem governance baseline to understand both the changes in ecosystems, both biophysical goods and services, resilience, et cetera, but also human activities and well being. And we begin with a process of looking back, and this is done with people of the place, as Holly was mentioning, and asking the question, how did this bioregion get to where it is today? And that goes through a detailed process. Then we do what we call crossing the bridge and looking forward. But the looking back is rooted in timeline, a development, a co-creation of this timeline of key issues of response to change over time, understanding trends and key variables, trying to understand where was the power and the authority across markets, government, and civil society? What might be some case studies? And then with that, moving towards the looking ahead to imagining trend projection and issues of biophysical and human dimensions change, the selection of issues, what might be goals and objectives, what, who and what are the core partners and what might be the key variables to monitor over time with a real focus on the now, the strengths and weaknesses of the existing governance system. So much of this work, we consider this establishing a baseline as a set of reference points to measure progress on response to ecosystem change. So that's a quick uh, summary of the framework. Um, and we're actually doing a series of cohorts 
of training working with communities in the Gulf of Maine, but also currently in Iceland and Scotland and Ireland, as well as a, um, a tropicals um, cohort working in the sacred headwaters of the Amazon, but also in Costa Rica, in the Nicoya Peninsula in Guanacaste. So this work is actually now being done by people of the place in those regions. And this is the kind of work that we believe can be of value and may be useful in other areas within the bioregional framing of the Arctic network. So I mentioned the Gulf of Maine, we're working at a very urban, an urban rural interface and then a very rural area, areas in Boston and Portland and Casco Bay, but also at this border at Canada, uh, which is best defined as ancestral Passamaquoddy homeland, indigenous communities that have lived there since time immemorial and are still there and actively engaged in partnership in this effort of seeing response to ecosystem change. We're also working on a transformation transect that links these communities together to allow for bigger and greater public involvement. Uh, we have our core headquarters here in Portland, Maine. And these all three of these areas have physical spaces for learning and ongoing adaptation. This is a novel initiative. Uh, we don't see a huge degree of competition. In fact, enormous opportunities for collaboration with both academia, but also uh, civil society, governments, and market forces. Uh, everything from big box corporate uh, enterprises to small scale uh, enterprises as well. So some of this work involves areas of defining what we would call the area of focus and understanding next wider scales. This, uh, this idea of high quality engagement of local participants trends and key variables over time, this co-creation idea of telling the story of place using a concept of a timeline and develop these case studies. And again, a set of reference points to measure progress. So we build the capabilities and competencies of people within these communities to do this. This is not an academic exercise only. This is very much a public engagement exercise. And through this process, we create what we call building a bioregional macroscope to better see into the food systems, the education systems, areas of ecosystem restoration, things such as fisheries, uh, ecosystem based fisheries management, the ideas around sovereignty and food sovereignty for indigenous communities, communication systems, finance, tourism, public health, etc. And this is so key because at a bioregional scale, it's very important to understand the relationship at other scales and the issues that are happening at other scales, as well as the cross connectivity and connectivity up and down. So by focusing on the bioregion across this Northern Arctic, U-Arctic thematic network, it allows us to better see and connect across these scales of change. And so finally, some of the things that we'll be working on to underscore what Holly mentioned, things like learning journeys and seeing together into the systems. This idea of systems mapping using GIS, social network analysis, net weaving, um, understanding both diagnostics as well as what might be prescriptions of change, but understanding what's missing, what's the challenges, what's holding transformation systems back and how to connect, how to scale both deep, wide and up. So just wanna welcome you again. I'm here on the um, in ancestral Wabanaki homeland. This is in Portland, Maine at the New England Ocean Cluster. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Holly. Thank you, Glenn, very much. And, and from, um... Our friends in Scotland, uh, just a book recommendation in the chat function for everyone. Uh, the Agnes, Agnes Rennie's latest book, The Changing Outer Hebrides, uh, Galson and the Meaning of Place, an investigation of the human ecology of her village through the millennia. So uh, put that on your reading list, everyone. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our colleague, uh, Sigurd uh, Christian's daughter, whose name I probably just butchered horribly, uh, who will be speaking uh, to us from the Agricultural University of Iceland. It is all yours. 
I am the associate professor and dean of the department of planning and design. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna, as all of you know, where Iceland is located, uh, we are very, uh, we are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is a map of the ocean current. So we get the cold ocean from the north and the hot from the south. So there's a lot of, a lot of things going on here in the ocean and a lot of fisheries. And uh, this is just a map of Iceland. And uh, for uh, those that haven't been here, uh, the settlement is around the coast. So, um, and then in the middle is like, a, a, uh, it's a uh, volcanoes, glaciers, and so nobody lives in the middle. So it's we live. It's like a donut. We live on the coastline, uh, and that's where all the settlement is. Uh, so it's very linked to the ocean and uh, and fishery, and also to agriculture. And uh, we cannot uh, talk about Iceland without mentioning the geothermal. And the geothermal is uh, it's like uh, it's really great because we use it to heat up our houses. We have hot pools. And uh, a little bit about the, my university, the agricultural university is uh, this is the um, main campus, and uh, it it started as agricultural university, but now uh, it has uh, environmental and forest science and also planning and design. And then we have a land restoration training program. Uh, and then we have uh, on our beautiful Icelandic course, and, uh, and then we have a program of nature and environmental science. Uh, we have forest science, restoration, ecology, and management. And then we have a landscape architecture. Uh, it's an undergrad program. Uh, and then we have a, a master program in, in planning. And uh, we have also a master program called NTIL, Environmental Changes of Higher Latitude, which is a collaborative program between uh, uh, the Agricultural University and other universities. Uh, the Greenland Institute of Natural Resource, uh, ULU, University of Helsinki, EMU, Lund, and Aarhus. And then the student travel uh, in between the countries and take courses and do field work. Uh, and in this uh, program, we do have a course on Arctic planning. Uh, and then we have uh, individual design master uh, program, for example, for students who wants to specialize in agriculture. And then we do have a doctoral program. And uh, I wanted to show you uh, where the main campuses, we have this beautiful, uh, uh, it's called Antakit, it's a pro protected habit area and it's designed as a Ramsar site. So uh, we have this um, green line, Greenland white fronted goose that come from uh, Greenland to rest and uh, get fat before they fly off to Europe. So it's a very beautiful uh, area. Uh, and then we have the uh, land restoration training program, and that's part of the United Nations schools. Uh, and here we get uh, students from uh, uh, Asia and Af Africa uh, to come study um, uh, the land and land restoration. Uh, a little bit about the planning and design department. Uh, I'm going quick. We are focusing on the nature, the economy, the government, the regulation, and how those factors mix together and create the built environment, which then is the, uh, it is the state where we live our uh, life. So we also have to study the liability of the communities. Um, and this is our PhD student. He is looking at resilience, sustainable coasts. Um, and many of you know her already. Uh, her name is Maria Wilke, and then we are uh, also taking part in a uh, uh, thematic network, local scales, planning, climate change, and resilience. Uh, and we have ha run some uh, graduate seminar on climate change impact. And then finally, I, I, I want to mention this project I'm working on. It's, uh, it's uh, through the Fulbright Arctic Innovation Program, where I'm looking at uh, circumpolar development. 
and studying uh, uh, how this how towns and cities and maybe we will have even new cities if we start uh, sailing across the Arctic. Yeah, and finally, I want to mention this book. It came out a few years ago. It's about Nordic experiment on sustainable planning policy and practice. Uh, and I was the editor of this, it's published by Ruthie, and it gives a good overview of planning in the Nordic countries. And I won an award for it, so I'm very happy about it. And that's it from me. It's just a broad interview to introduce myself and my school. Thank you. Next up is our colleague Stuart Gibb from the University of Highlands and Islands in Scotland. Stuart, the, the virtual floor is yours. Um, well, it's really good to, to see uh, people around the table today. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Um, and it's good to have our initial partners here. And, and thank you to Holly uh, in particular for really enthusiastic leadership of this, uh, of this network. My name's Stuart Gibb. Whoa, this is uh, taking off. My name's uh, Stuart Gibb from the University of the, the Highlands and Islands. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of information about our region, the university, where we see the opportunity for contributing to and benefiting from this, this network. So just a little geography, first of all, just so everyone understands. We've got a map of Europe here showing the United Kingdom showing the best bit of the United Kingdom at the, the top there, and then the Highlands and Islands region shown in, in red here. So an area that covers more than half of the total land mass of, of Scotland. Uh, some of you may have been here, but even for those of you who haven't, it's a very well known region. I've just picked out some screen snips from uh, that have appeared in a number of films. Uh, this is Island Donna Castle, it appeared in Highlander, uh, Glen Coe from The Skyfall, the James Bond film. Uh, this is from Sky, Prometheus, various Harry Potter films you may recognise this landscape from. And uh, going a little bit further back, some of the wonderful beaches on the west coast uh, from Local Hero. So whether you have or haven't been here, you're probably reasonably familiar with some of the landscapes in this, in this area. And it's an area that has a very distinctive history, a distinctive culture and environment. Uh, the region has around 100 different inhabited islands to the north and to the west, and around 10,000 kilometres of coastline and extensive mountain regions. So you can start to consider that if you're going to design a university to work in this area, it's going to be a very distinctive organisation also. Our population is less than 10%, the population of the region is less than 10% of, of the whole of Scotland, but it's spread around 60% of the land mass. And so we have a very low population density, and this gives us a distinctive set of socioeconomic circumstances. But those circumstances uh, allow us to share many challenges and many opportunities with other regions around the high north, in Arctic regions. That's why we're delighted to be part of this project. And within the context of the University of the Arctic, the UHI, the University of the Highlands and Islands, is a founding non-Arctic member of the University of the Arctic. So we've been in this endeavour from the beginning. Our economy in the area is not really a singular economy, but it's rather a mosaic of local economies. But to summarise it, compared to Scotland, compared to the country as a whole, we have a greater proportion of jobs in tourism and recreation, in agriculture, aquaculture, forestry and fishing, i.e. in utilising our natural resources. So issues of conservation and sustainability are fundamentally important to this area. We have a deficiency in terms of professional, scientific and technical roles, and we've a, a higher public sector uh, proportion of the economy than the rest of Scotland. And of course, uh, some of you will know a significantly high proportion of both small businesses and seasonal employment. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how our, our economy is. But we've real growth sectors that include renewables, marine energy in particular, 
and food and drink. And again, these are areas of the economy that are coupled to how we use, manage and conserve our, our environment. So the University of the Highlands and Islands is a, a distinctive uh, partnership. It involves 13 regional uh, institutions spread over around 500 kilometres from north to south, as you can see here. It's Scotland's newest university, and it's also Scotland's most northerly university. And we're a tertiary organisation. This means fairly uniquely in Scotland that we, um, we encompass further education, higher education and research activity. But in each of these activities, uh, it's enriched by the people, the environment, the economy, culture and heritage of our region and communities. But not to be peripheral, and oh, sorry, not to be parochial in this, it's about for us to reach out to the rest of the world through our research and our teaching in these areas. The university's mission is to have a transformational impact on the prospects of our region, its economy, its people and communities. And in that, as I've mentioned, we share many challenges and opportunities with regions around high north and Arctic areas. So when we look at the thematic focus uh, for this thematic network, you can see that what we are trying to do as a university is really closely related to understanding the role that bioregional and system strategies can play in supporting northern communities and in activating those strategies in the face of climate change and other disruptive events. So our mission is entirely coherent with the thematic focus of this network. So rather than, than saying, why are we part of this network? Hopefully it's very obvious and rather the question might be, why would we not be part of, of this network? With a range of relevant activity, but just to mention one area, uh, I'll just bring these up. These are some of the projects that we've engaged with through um, the Northern Periphery and Arctic Programme. And it's around areas of uh, sustainable ecotourism. It's around environmental protection, renewable energy, and marine pollution. Now, these are areas that link many of the regions in, in which we, we live. For, for me, and this is very much a personal opinion, the network has a number of key characteristics. It's interdisciplinary, as we've mentioned. It's international, yes, but for me, it's a little more important than that. It goes deeper. It's interregional. It's linking together these areas across the high north that share much in terms of environment, communities, population densities, challenges and opportunities. The intergenerational aspect is also emphasised in this project, and this is something that's often missed, but I think is really important in terms of how we look at sustainability. And of course, as Holly said, people of the place is right at the core of this project. It's not an add-on, it's not simply about engagement, it's right at the heart. And for me, these characteristics will help us meet the challenges, as we've heard, around climate change, and will help us uh, to meet some of the challenges and opportunities that we've got in terms of meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm delighted that we've got Betsy Parker uh, here, um, who maybe is interested in this, this area. So, just to finish off, I would like to extend that invitation. What we have is an initial partnership of the organization shown right here. We're in our developmental phase. This is an opportunity to join us, to help shape the network and make it work for our regions. So this is almost a call to arms. Please join us. Please help address these challenges. Uh, my email's here if anyone would like to get in touch. Otherwise, it's an open invitation. And thank you for your attention, and I'll hand back to Holly. Thank you very much, Stuart. And our final presenter uh, today is uh, Yelena Gladden from the University of Tumen in Russia. We were so thrilled, I think, when Yelena and I met in a weird Zoom chance uh, to meet each other and see that this work was happening 
across the globe uh, in a very interesting and similar way and synergistic way. So, uh, Yelena, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Holly, and thank you for having me here and thank you for coming. I see so many people are also from my university and our community. So, yeah, and I'm here to present my university and my research team and uh, to share uh, our work, the work we have done already, and the work we are planning to do jointly with uh, you, with all colleagues across the globe. And uh, our team and our university has already been involved into green agenda and low carbon agenda. And for us, it is very important and very relevant to participate in this uh, project in this thematic network in this web webinar, particularly, and to be a member of such a great team uh, of colleagues and uh, people who work on the same issues. And uh, we have already, like I myself and my colleagues, have already done related projects and have been involved in related projects. And we have uh, some publications and some books also. And I'll share them uh, via email. So I haven't included them into the presentation, but there are some uh, work we have already done. And uh, I'll be happy to share all these works with you as well. And uh, now some uh, pictures and some description of my university. Uh, we are located in uh, Western Siberia and uh, we, uh, the Western Siberia as a region is here. And uh, our university is located in the Southern part. So sometimes we, are call, we call ourselves as South, uh, Southern uh, University in Western Siberia. And uh, our university uh, is one of the most dynamically developing uh, university and the region is very uh, dynamically developing in different dimensions. Like many industries uh, are developing in the South and I suppose all uh, of you know uh, that very many industries are developing in the northern part uh, of Tumen region uh, in the Amal area. And we are very closely connected uh, with this area also in educational projects, in research projects. Our public authorities are doing different joint projects. So we are like working and sharing one territory and uh, very similar and closely related projects here. And uh, the university is also developing educational uh, projects, very innovative. We are involved in uh, many new, newly initiatives which are presented in Russia uh, as a country. And globally, we are also trying to work with uh, innovative um, projects and with universities who work in Arctic related uh, th themes and Arctic related projects. And uh, also our university is one of the leaders of uh, large scale and uh, breakthrough uh, projects. For example, uh, now we are uh, working, as I have said, at low, uh, on low carbon agenda. And very recently, a week ago, uh, the first carbon polygon uh, has been opened in Tumen region. It is on our university uh, location and this uh, is the first bird so to say uh, in the series of carbon polygons which will be opening in Russia uh, I think about 10 polygons uh, are expected to be opened in the country and uh, this is a territory for these polygons are uh, the territory uh, of uh, unique ecosystems and uh, they can be used for development and testing technologies for uh, technologies, remote technologies and ground uh, technologies to uh, measure uh, carbon and uh, emissions and to grow uh, crops and uh, other plants uh, which can be used, uh, which can be meaningful for climate change and uh, re reduction of climate change. And there will be about 10 polygons, as I have already said. Also, uh, we have very many uh, international and uh, international projects related to climate change. And for example, this picture, which I'm showing, it was a territory uh, for uh, huge uh, research projects, which we jointly did with uh, German universities. And it was uh, related to um, measuring and testing how uh, cultivated uh, territories can be used for food and energy crops. And this project also has very 
big value in climate change agenda. And the University of Tumon was chosen as a partner and we jointly with um, uh, several uh, international universities uh, worked on this uh, project. And the research question was how we can mitigate negative impacts of agricultural land use uh, and how it can change uh, ecosystem services and biodiversity. And the Western Siberia was chosen as a unique territory, uh, which is very, um, meaningful in this uh, sort of uh, projects. And also our university has different facilities and uh, uh, places for uh, doing Arctic related research. For example, uh, in the Amal region, uh, we, are ha we have this uh, station, uh, which can be used for different kinds of research and every, year, uh, year round, there are year round projects when uh, scientists of different areas of studies go there and they work on uh, biological uh, research, on uh, chemistry research, on uh, 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 very uh, climate, climate, climatic research. And it is a very uh, interesting and very useful uh, facility, which can also be involved in our thematic network. And we can also try to organize some events or some uh, research over there. Uh, for example, uh, every year uh, we are doing international summer school, which we called Way to the North. And the first uh, summer school was done with uh, this um, consortium of German uh, schools, German universities. It was our first experience. And so that time for six years, we are doing this. And we uh, do the research route, so to say, from Tumen, from the southern part of Siberia, to the north, and uh, we involve students and uh, faculty, uh, lec lecturers who present different aspects of uh, Siberia, of changes, of uh, environmental uh, specifics of Siberia, uh, land uh, specifics, uh, air specifics, climate, and so on. So uh, to summarize this part of my presentation, I would like to say that we have already had big, uh, great experience of working with international uh, uh, researchers and faculty, and we are looking forward to work uh, to enhance our uh, collaboration and to involve uh, uh, all of you in these projects. And we very uh, we wanted very much to be involved in the joint projects with all of you. And uh, now uh, also I would like to uh, out uh, underline some specifics of human origin. So why it can be chosen and it has been chosen for climate related uh, projects. So we have uh, very specific uh, rural territories with a certain climate, with certain climate conditions and certain uh, land use conditions. And also uh, the specifics of, of our territory is that now rural communities experiencing uh, transformation processes and we can uh, face and we face a strong differences in the quality of life in different rural, rural settlements, disparities in infrastructure, disparities in uh, job opportunities, natural resources access, and for example, some territories have extremely unfavorable bioclimatic conditions. The other can be used for carbon sequestration uh, and can be used for climate friendly uh, crops and plants uh, and forests are very uh, helpful for climate uh, prevention of climate change. And uh, using and uh, studying uh, the uh, territories of uh, human region, we can also find some, uh, we can capture and reduce uh, the amount of carbon dioxide. On the other hand, uh, the um, region is characterized by economic growth, a huge ec economic growth, growth. More than uh, 25 new industries have been introduced uh, since 2000, uh, the beginning of 2000. At the same time, uh, economic growth sometimes versus the quality of, of the environment and the quality of life in different settlements in different small cities, small villages. And this is a very unique situation uh, considering uh, human region. And that is why uh, several years ago, we have cr uh, we cr um, created, uh, gathered uh, a team of uh, colleagues who have been working together in different areas. As you can see, our team is very mu is multidisciplinary. So we have uh, people working in different areas of studies like geography and uh, uh, 
philosophy, economy, uh, uh, law, and regulations like myself. And uh, we have initiated uh, the project called Region uh, Green Transformation, Values, Practices, and Social Economic Effects. And uh, there, there are several pre uh, presentations we've already done on the on internet international conferences in Russian universities, and there are several works we have already published as a result of this project. And uh, the aim of the project, the task of the project, uh, war is to develop uh, effective tools and mechanisms for social economic development and to ena enable public author authorities and local communities to, to work together, to plan together, to ensure social economic well-being, and to contribute to greening of the region and at the same time greening doesn't uh, mean and doesn't perceive uh, as an obstacle to economic and social development so the instruments that we are working out are aiming to increase number of rural residents uh, involved in various environmentally friendly practices and activities and also we are working out instruments uh, to and tools to establish communication between businesses, local people, and authorities. Uh, how we see our participation and uh, working in this uh, in our thematic network. Uh, having listened to presentations, I understand that we are speaking about the same issues, and we aim to discuss together and to develop jointly these tools and strategies that we uh, have some. Uh, experience and we are do, trying we can try to do together and these uh, tools and strategies can be very useful for sustainable regional development our regions and our countries are different but at the same time we all have risky agricultural practice uh, environment and situation uh, we are all aiming to preserve natural capital and biocapacity and we are all close to northern territories and we can disseminate our practices and uh, experiences and uh, tools and uh, expertise to the northern territories and as we see our joint result and expected result can be case studies with which we can unite and present to each other and to commun other communities. We can work out on policy briefs, uh, which can be kind of unified. Uh, certainly uh, our country is also different in uh, po politics and in uh, reg legal regulations, but I think for sustainable development, it's very important to find this uh, unified uh, tools and instruments and maybe even regulations. Of course, we can do joint publications and uh, Holland and myself will be discussing students projects and it is a very good idea to make a kind of joint curriculum, which we can develop together and we can involve our young generation students, we can transfer our knowledge and our experience to them uh, jointly, I think it is a very good idea as well. And uh, here we are, uh, we are presenting um, types of work we are doing now and we can do together with you. Uh, this can be analytical work, as I have said, case studies and models of, of, uh, described by different countries, uh, pro projecting work uh, to develop jointly uh, tools and instruments about green practices, bioregional planning and so on, and uh, kind of regulatory job which can be also useful for our regions, for our countries, like policy briefs, strategies, and curriculum. Uh, we have already done a lot uh, in, uh, concerning our small, I would say, uh, territory, uh, where our uh, research project is able to what our research project is targeting. And uh, we have found out what green practices exist in a uh, Tumen region, in the south of Tumen region, what values uh, our people share. And uh, to do this, to do this classification, we conducted survey and uh, more, uh, about 400 residents of Tumen region have been interviewed. And we were asking about their attitudes, about their uh, activities, which they do and how they see green region and how they think green region uh, can be created. Also, we uh, did a software, we created a software and a um, program to analyze all these uh, social practices and social network and compiled a list, a list of green practices and initiatives existing in, uh, in the south of Tumen 
area. Also, we did some social, uh, some graphs and uh, try to uh, picture connections uh, within green practices between businesses, uh, local authorities, and um, uh, communities, local communities. And uh, by this, we are trying to outline mechanisms, uh, motivation of people, involvement, expectations, and how they can be implemented on the regulatory level, on the policy level. Uh, and just to share some results of our work and our dream, our uh, desire is to uh, do the same in English language and to share this, uh, to, to see the same from your universities, from your countries. And if we do uh, some uh, description of how uh, green practices can be initiated, can be supported and can be presented to the society, I think we can uh, do some really, we can achieve some really interesting results uh, done uh, simultaneously and done uh, the same level uh, of all uh, Arctic countries and just other countries involved in this network. For example, we are having this uh, information platform website uh, where different practices, green practices are presented and uh, news uh, are compiled about what is done related to uh, environmentally friendly activities and uh, uh, low carbon activities and other things like that. So uh, it would be very interesting if we can have the same from uh, other countries or share our results with other countries and other communities. All well, that is by now. Thank you, Elena. Thank you all of our friends uh, for joining us today. It's been an amazing journey from Maine all the way to Tumen. Uh, with stops in Iceland and Scotland. So again, an invitation to please email me at hparker3 at une.edu if you are interested in joining us or learning more about what that looks like. Uh, also, we have your emails from the chat. If you are still want to have some more information, want to drop your email there. We will be circulating an agenda and an invitation to our working group meeting in October, um, where we will be discussing some of the initiatives we presented here today. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please be in touch. Check out our website at the UArctic um, web pages. And uh, we look very much forward to working with uh, all of you. Thank you very much and have a great day.